So welcome everyone to today's as an expert session where we are talking everything merchandising for CPG brands. And today my guest is Stevie Allegretto, who is the director of account management for Trax Retail. He works directly with brands to help them with merchandising. And so he knows firsthand uh, what brands are doing, what's working, what's not working to be able to share his experience and expertise with you. So Stevie, I'd love for you just to give a quick introduction to yourself and the work that you do. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. Um, and thanks for everybody for attending today and, and for everybody who's going to watch later on. Um, it, it's absolutely a, a privilege to, to be on here and just to kind of share, um, you know, information that I know and from, from experience working in the field. It's interesting because I was just chatting with Jordan a, a minute or two ago and it's like, what questions are going to come up? And it's and it's like, well, you know, it's basically everything you know. So, but you just instinctively um, just don't know how to share it or whatnot. So this should be cool. Um, so my name is Stevie Allegretto. I'm a director of account management here at Trax Retail. Um, I've been with the company, uh, I believe a, a little over five or coming up on six years. Um, I originally was part of the survey.com uh, team, the, the original team before Trax acquired them. So I've been in the, in the retail merchandising uh, CPG business for about six years now. Uh, prior to that, I spent uh, the first part of my career, uh, 10 to 12 years in finance, um, originally from New Jersey, and then I moved down here to Charlotte, North Carolina about eight years ago. Awesome, Stevie. And tell me a little bit about the types of companies that you work with um, for merchandising. Yeah, so it's it's really the whole gamut, right? So prior to the, the Trax acquisition, um, we would deal with anybody from an emerging brand that is just coming off D to C and might have gotten picked up by 50 or 100 locations all the way through uh, to, to the large caps like Frito-Lay and Pepsi, so on and so forth. Um, when Trax uh, acquired the company, we actually divided the two. So we have a, a, a CPG or enterprise team is what we call it, where those folks handle the, the, the large cap, mostly the public companies, P&G, Unilevers of the world. Um, that is not the team that I'm on. I'm on the team that handles emerging and mid cap brands. So anybody, again, that recently just launched a kombucha brand and they're in stores all the way up to, you know, mid caps that are doing, let's say a billion to a billion five in sales. Awesome. I love that. So I love to just kick the conversation off to help set some context for everyone. Um, I know there, the term merchandising is used a bunch, but is very little bit is not always fully understood. So I'd love for you to just share like, what does merchandising encompass and the work that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, um, from a from like a top level standpoint, ultimately when you think of merchandising, there's there's so many like tactics and and things that could go behind it. But the main goal is to to sell more product, right? To sell more product and or stand out at the shelf. Um, and and merchandising in itself, like if I define it, it's like okay, if we assume that if the product is placed correctly at the store in a prime location, tagged, all that kind of stuff, like the sell the selling and the sales and the velocity will happen um so that's kind of like a, a top level um as far as like the blocking and tackling uh, for merchandising it's you know it's anything that a manufacturer can can a manufacturer or a vendor can do in store to help support that right so whether it's um you know making sure your products are pog compliant on the shelf right so pog compliant meaning you know, your all of your authorized SKUs are up in the store. Um, all of them are tagged correctly. If you're on promo, the promo tags, you know, is um, is up as well. Um, or or if if uh, you have missing SKUs on the shelf, like for example, you're authorized to carry four four SKUs in in X retail in certain retailer, and you know you go in and you're only seeing two SKUs. Um, you know, having that conversation or manager interaction um, to say, hey, we're authorized to carry four. Are you willing to carry the other two? You know, certain things along that lines. Um, it, we call it filling voids, obviously. Um, applying any type of like POS, right? So whether that's POS on the shelf, uh, applying shelf talkers or aisle violators, or maybe a door cling if you're on a freezer, um, or, or even like individual IRCs on the units themselves, right? 
So 50 cents off, dollar off, um, could be setting up displays, right? Like if, if you send a shipper to a store, um, you want to make sure that it's not just sitting in the back room, that it's pulled out, um, that it's put on the sales floor, or, or if you're, if you're paying for a display at a store, right? Like a lot of these big boxes, Target and all that kind of stuff, cost a lot of money to have a, a, an end cap set or whatever the case may be. Um, and you can't always rely solely on the retailer to do it. So you need to have some type of plan or team in place to ensure the compliance of that, right? So going in, making sure that it's up. And if it's not up, doing something about it, making sure that it gets fixed. Stevie, here's what's interesting is when I was running my CPG brand T-Squares, I was so naive at the beginning where I thought as a brand, my job was to sell our products to the retailer, somehow get it there. And then their job was to sell it off the retail shelf. Yeah. And that the, the management kind of ended there beyond just like helping drive customers to the store a little bit. And boy, was I wrong <laughs> in just realizing that as CPG founders, like we have to be take ownership of making sure the product um, gets to the consumer, like all the way to their home safely. And that yeah. means doing everything that you just mentioned, mentioned to make sure our product moves off the shelf and in the retailer. And one thing that I found out in talking to retailers was that, you know, they see their job as having a customer base who comes to their store and buys products off their shelf. And that's kind of it where they have too many brands to like manage individually. And right. so they're focused on just providing the location and making sure their products available versus yep. selling for each individual brand. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So two things to, to say there. So when people normally ask like, you know, what do you do or, you know, what does merchandising, what does merchandising bring to the table? I always kind of like to say that it's like the last 10% or the last 10 yards of execution, right? Like as a, as a brand owner or founder or manufacturer, like your job, you have so many other things that you have to do prior to, to making sure that your product is set on the shelf correctly. Right. So that's where merchandising or, or, you know, or a team comes in or your own field sales team comes in to make sure that all that stuff is compliant. Um, it, it's funny you mentioned, I just got back from BevNet uh, late last night. So there was a mix of brands and retailers and co-packers and all that kind of fun stuff there. Um, but it was interesting on, on a couple of the different panels. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was, uh, like someone flat out said, like distributors aren't used to be brand builders anymore, you know, and people think that whenever they partner with, you know, a distributor or a broker, whatever the case, not a broker, but a distributor per se, that like, they're going to do it all for you. Or in your instance, um, it's actually funny. I was going up the elevator with a guy who just launched in Sprouts and I just asked him, I was like, Oh, I'm like, you, you know, you have a plan of place, blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, he's like, I just, you know, I'm just going to rely on sprouts to, you know, fix all that stuff. And, and, and like, that's the, like, that's the initial mindset, right? Like you would expect the person that wears the, you know, uh, the shop, right. T-shirt or a Harris Teeter t-shirt that they're going to go be the ones that goes into the back and pulls your product and restocks it and so on and so forth. It's like, that's not really the case of retail, right? Like they may do it for a Pepsi or, you know, they have their own teams as well too, but when especially when it comes to emerging brands like unfortunately the retailers are not really looking out for you in that capacity yeah you know that kind of brings up something else where with t-square as well when we were launching in one particular retailer we i went into the store like because we were supposed to have a launch date and first off the product like wasn't even in the shelf shelf because it got denied at the back door and then once it finally did make it to the shelf the retailer actually placed it in five different locations across yeah. the hundred stores. And yeah. so we were selling energy bars, but in one area, they were like by the, cause they're in the multi-server pouch. One was in like the granola aisle. One yeah. was in like the organic snack aisle. One was in like the healthy, like protein bar set that was kind of by the, by, pharmacy. By the pharmacy. Yeah. 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 Like it was so bad that I couldn't even find my product. And so I thought like, if I can't find my product, how is one of our customers going to? Right. Exactly. I mean, the retailers themselves, like their pure goal is to, um, obviously they want your brand to sell, like velocity is key, but they want more, uh, like units in the basket, right? Like they're not just looking out for your brand. They want to see like how your brand can also ha get 
other items in the basket for checkout for a larger, you know, a larger sales in general. Awesome. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Mike's. Not sure if your name is Mike or the company's just name is Mike. Um, we'd love for you. Can you come off of mute? I'd love for you to ask your question to to Stevie and adding a little bit more context. Hi, Stevie. So uh, I'm Mike Price. I uh, uh, I know a number of your guys at Scratch. I uh, I came from Unilever. I set up global image recognition between 2014 and 2020 globally across 35 countries. So I'm oh, nice. in the big brand world. Uh, but I was keen to join this because uh, however however much experience you've got, you're never too old to learn. So yep. I'm just curious to understand how you would help perhaps emerging brands with segmentation and so, you know which stores to go to. Because as the example that uh, George has just given, you know, there's a lot of stores and brands going to build up. So how would you perhaps with a, a limited budget, how can you help smaller brands be more targeted? Yeah, so you don't mean like where to launch first. You're talking about where to support first, right? Where to go, where to go in yeah. terms of, you know, how do we know where to get, you know, to maximize yeah. our sales velocity? So, I mean, I think I, ideally you always want to to win where you're at first. Um, so it, whatever your your largest, biggest client customer is on your side, you want to be able to to make sure that that's, um, that that banner is like your showroom. Right. Like you, we always kind of use the example and, and Whole Foods is great with this. Like a lot of brands use Whole Foods as as their example, as far as um, trying to get into other retailers, like look at how we're doing here. Um, but as far as the the segmentation, the visit, uh, which stores to pick, I mean, it, it could come down to a couple of different variables, but um, where you're seeing, you know, where you're seeing low sales that you believe you should be having sales. Right. Um, where you're looking to drive incremental placement or, um, you know, uh, ad additional, additional facings in a banner. Um, if you have your own field sales team, that's great. Obviously you would, you would use merchandising or, or a third party to, to fill in the gaps where they're not covering or where a broker's not covering. Um, so the, that could be a segmentation as well, but I think ultimately it comes down to, I, you know, one, knowing your baseline, right? Like knowing where you're at in, in all of your stores, if you can afford that. And then from there, tackling, you know, tackling it one by one, right? Like which are the most important customers on your end to grow or to sustain? And then how do you pick up, um, how do you, how do you drive additional, uh, more sales in low performing stores? And I'll, even on the reverse of that too, right? Like if you have stores that are you, your top selling stores that are killing it, you don't just want to like put them on autopilot, right? But like you you, you may just end up uh, visiting them once a quarter or once every six months or something like that versus, you know, locations that may need uh, monthly visits or every other week visits or something like that. Uh, hopefully that kind of answers what you were asking. Yeah. That was really great. Thanks for that question, Mike. I think that was also really helpful. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, if you have a question, any question at all on merchandising, we'd love for you to drop that in the chat, and then I will invite you to come up to ask that to the group. Um, another, Steve, kind of based off of Mike's question is, when should a brand start start merchandising, right? We have a lot of companies who might be in five stores, 10 stores, maybe they're bringing on their first 100 store chain. Um, when do you find just from the companies you've worked with, what you've seen, like it starts becoming really like valuable or really effective? Yeah. So um, again, from, from a manufacturer standpoint, I mentioned it earlier, like you guys have so much to do and so much on your plate just to make sure that your product gets made correctly, delivered to the store correctly on the, you know, and then on the shelf and all that kind of stuff all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so I think it comes down to, you know, separating your, your time in store from like that R and D portion that you're, you're kind of probably more in train with to, you know, to know what works first. Um, and then once you know what works, then, you know, uh, hand it over to a third party or whatever, whatever you, path you may take, because ultimately like you have more important stuff to do as a, CEO or founder, whatever the case may be, right? Um, e easier, easier said than done. From a, if you want to look at it from like a numbers perspective, I would say, I mean, you know, at, at once you hit a hundred locations, 
um, if you do not have a field sales team, you want to get some type of visibility, right? So even if you're at a, even if you get to a hundred stores, um, you know, and you're trying to grow your brand, like you should know what's going on in every one of those stores inside and out, right? So um, I think it comes down to two things, right? And a and hundred isn't like the cutoff, but just you, you kind of get the example of what I'm saying. So I think it comes down to that. And then, you know, allocating your time correctly, right? Like if you know you don't have enough time or enough resources to get that data and information that merchandising would provide, then then outsource it because you got so much more other stuff on your plate to deal with. That's great. Do you have any good um, things that you've seen brands doing in terms of like getting that data to understand like which stores are performing best or worse? Do you see them like just using their data from like Kehi or you know, yeah. like, you know, where their cases are being sold? I think it's a blend of, you know, where were they, could get, where they could get it from. Um, when it comes to like store level data, it's very expensive for, for a brand to purchase. Right. So whether it is using, you know, Kehi or, or spins data or Nielsen data, whatever it may be, that's all good and well, but you, you have to be able to like marry all of it together. Um, and sometimes like, it's very hard to interpret, right. Um, having, you know, having an arm of, of a merchandising team or, or a field sales team, um, it allows you to, to not just get the store, the store level sales data that you may get from spins or K or whatever it may be. Um, but actual visit data as well too, so that you can then analyze them both together side by side to see trends or maybe, you know, why certain stores are selling below normal or what, you know, whatever that may be. Awesome. Yeah. One thing that I've seen brands starting to use as well is um, there's a software called Crisp that creates a dashboard to organize all your data. So you can actually see um, a map of the entire country, like all the wow. stores that you're in, and it'll show yeah. you your lowest performing stores, your highest performing stores. So you can tactically choose like, how do you see what's going well at your best stores and right. what's going poorly at your worst stores. Um, so that's a cool tool that I've seen um, used as well. Yeah. I mean, honestly, cause you want to, if you do spend money on merchandising, like you want it to, you want to, to not just give you visibility, but you ultimately you're trying to get some type of like ROI out of it, right? Like what am I getting back for spending on merchandising? Obviously there's fixing issues, but then when it comes to the data side of it as well, yeah, being able to have a, a nice place to compile it all and then figure out from there, you can prescribe, kind of going back to what Mike mentioned, like how do you segment stores out? Once you have that baseline, then you can prescribe where you wanna do future and follow visits. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, one question I got in through the chat from Sam, they asked, what are some of the horror stories when it comes to merchandising? <laughs> um, oh boy, that's kind of a, kind of a vague one, but I, I would say, um, and just for a start, like they're starting out, they're like in the research phase of starting a CPG brand. Okay. Um, and I think either like merchandising issues were like, the one I mentioned where people launch without merchandising and there's oh, okay. products like okay. all over the place. And I think also where like maybe someone spends a bunch of money on like display shippers and they never make it out the back door yeah. or things yeah. like that. Yeah. No. Okay. I got you. So, I mean, waiting, if you're launching in a retailer or if you're launching new SKUs somewhere in a retailer, don't wait two to three months for the sales data to come back in to figure out if the launch went well. I mean, that's probably like one of the largest mistakes. Um, I could make like a pun and say, well, you should hire tracks right off the bat, but it, it, you know, that's, that's not what this calls about. But um, yeah, I mean, I've seen some, some bad things where like, um, you know, X retailer will say, you know, we're going to, we're going to give you like a three month runway or a test, um, and then the brand like doesn't either, they don't have budget or they don't believe in supporting it, supporting merchandising behind it to see what's going on to fix the issues. And they may get yanked a month and a half in like, it, or, or it, those may not be the right timelines, right? Like they may give them a six month runway and, and three months in, if the brand's not performing well, like a retailer, will, they can, they have the authority to pull you, right? They'll say, no, this just isn't working. So if you don't, you know, uh, if you don't use merchandising as quote unquote insurance to like make sure that the stuff is correct, I mean, you could, you could lose a retailer overnight.
That's a really good point. Would you say that new retailer launch is like one of the key moments when you should like really making sure you have your yeah. merchandising and launch strategy really figured out? Yeah. And it's, and absolutely. And it's like a multiple prong approach, right? Like you want to go in, you want to make sure going back to, to, to what we mentioned right in the beginning, like you want to make sure that the authorized SKUs, the SKUs that you have authorized in that retailer are up and out on the sales floor and tag correctly. Right. Um, let's say you launch into 500 locations. You, you really do have no idea if, if they're all out there. So, uh, you know, a bad scenario would be, okay, we're fully compliant in, 300 stores, but we only have one out of four SKUs in the other 200 or whatever the case may be. And then from there, it's figuring out why, right? Like, was it just sitting in the back room? Did it never get delivered to this? Could it be a supply chain issue? You know, all these things start coming up. So if you don't have, you know, you can't just wish that it's going to be done, right? Like if you don't have um, the data or ammunition to figure out what's going on or why stuff has not been set, you can't fix it, right? So it, it's really just about getting visibility uh, when you launch in a retailer, making sure that everything is, you know, is up and compliant as it is versus just, yeah, we're going to trust the broker or wh whatever the case may be. Because again, bro brokers are great, right? Like, but they, they're in there, you know, touching 20 other brands as well too. So you, you may not be a priority for them on that first visit and it, you know, brokers, their, their reps have routes, right? So they may not get to your brand two or three weeks after the case, you know, so certain, certain scenarios like that. Um, you yeah. mentioned that, sorry, you mentioned something about a horror story about shit. And then you brought up shippers. So one that I saw um, not too long ago was, uh, a very a very well known brand that if I said it everybody would know who it is. Um, they uh, they launched um, a, a shipper promo in um, a Midwest retailer. I guess that's the best way to say it. In a Midwest retailer, expecting the shippers to be pulled um, from the back room and put on the sales floor. Um, so like two or three weeks after launch, they were seeing no sales of these certain SKUs that were on the shipper. So, you know, they reach out, give us a call and kind of like, hey, we need, we're bleeding right now. We need, we need someone to go in right away and fix it. So what we found out when we went in was half of the, more than half of the shippers weren't even delivered to the stores yet. They were still sitting in the DC. Um, so by, you know, them not supplying tracking information and all that kind of stuff, we were able to quickly go in, assess what was going on deliver that data back to the client. And then the, the client was able to use that in their conversations with the buyer, the, whatever the category manager at the time and say, Hey, like we're, this stuff hasn't even gotten to the store, you know? So then they use that. And this isn't a, again, this is a, not a, this is a, a negative one, right? They use that information to then try to get some type of money back from the, from the buyer, whatever the case may be. So it's not always like going in and fixing stuff, but also using the data and information to then help you fight whatever battles you need to fight on that side of the things. You know, it's funny. It reminds me of a, uh... I heard that they actually hire people to listen to the radio station um, for like ad companies to make sure the ads are actually played on the radio station because <laughs> you're paying them, you know, yeah. the advertisers paying the station to play it, but like, they're not going to sit there and listen to 24 hours of radio to see that it actually makes sense. Right. Same thing with retail, where a lot of times you end up having to pay for some of these additional slots or end caps. And what if your product doesn't make it on the shelf? Right. right. You still end up having the pay, but you don't get the benefit from it. Yeah. And maybe yeah. it's in half the stores. Maybe it's in, a, you know, three quarters of the stores, but that's still 25% that don't have the product up correctly. Yeah. Right. That you're paying for. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Um, Mike has another question. Do you believe regular route uh, collage or dynamic on-demand exception-based retail visits are best for smaller brands? Mike, what do you mean by route collage? Or is that a typo, maybe? It was route coolage. Sorry, my 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 poor uh, English English. So it was route coolage. Sorry. Yeah. So do you you know do you think it's better to visit on a regular schedule because you you referenced that earlier, or do you think it's to work in a more dynamic on demand? We've got yeah. an issue here. I think... go, go fix the issue. What what's what's your view for smaller brands? Because obviously the bigger brands they're going to have money to do stuff. And 
a full team and etc but it's obviously the dynamics are different for smaller teams yeah i think it, it's both right like it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish and what the main objective is right so if you have you know a retailer that that you have specific pain points that you're trying to fix um you may start with what you would call like an on demand approach but then it could turn into some type of continuity or, or long term coverage right so you go in and you fix the issue you know stop the bleeding or whatever like i mentioned before but then you may say to yourself we don't want this to happen again or whatever the case may be and then you could kind of flip that to a monthly or or you know, quarterly cadence, whatever you come up with. But I, I think it, it just depends on, you know, what you're looking to accomplish in that specific retailer, um, what your what your objective is, um, you know, what your obviously budget comes into play, right? Like what, what your budget is um, and then and then build it out from there. I don't think saying, let's say you're in a thousand stores across the country. I don't think saying you should be in every one of those stores you know, twice a month is the right answer. Like that's not, that's not really the right approach, right? That's actually like how mer merchandising is built like historically, right? Like it's just, you know, that broker model of it goes in on that regular cadence and whatever it is, and it can't change and all that kind of stuff is, is in my opinion, a little bit of a broken system, right? Um, whereas in you have companies like tracks and and others out there as well too that can you know make it a little more dynamic and, and strategic really is what it what it is go to certain stores on this cadence go to these stores on a different cadence on a different cadence awesome thanks for that um steve i got another question for someone just asking about um tactics and so can you go through i know you did like a, a little bit of a list off of some of the tactics for yeah. merchandising like in caps and displays and shippers um where do you which tactics do you recommend or see earlier stage brands using that tend to be more effective at actually moving units yeah so um when it comes to merchandising for new for new brands obviously um sampling and demos are, are a huge part of it for you guys right like trying uh driving trial in, in the beginning to 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 help bring brand awareness or or whatever it may be so um you know let's say that you you launch into or, or, or before i go into that i, I think it, it it depends on channel as well too so you can have certain tactics when it comes to like a conventional retailer, but then have different tactics when it comes to like independence or whatnot as well too. Um, but but in general, I think um, you know making sure that your brands are being are being sampled and 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 shown to the public um, is is a key is a key thing for for you all right out the bat. Um, yep, making sure that you know you are supporting your promos correctly, right? So if you're on promo. Um, on a promo schedule with the retailer itself, making sure that you have, you know, boots on the ground and support there so that the, the retailer itself knows that you're supporting it during that time. Um, or when you're off promo, applying some type of, of couponing or, or, or IRCs on the units, right? Um, I mentioned BevNet earlier. One of the things I, I heard um, that was pretty interesting was that, um, like investors and in brands, like they don't just look at like what your velocity is when you're in general. They like to see the difference of what your velocity and your and your unit sold are when you're on promo and off promo. So it's it's like two two different met main metrics for them. So when you're on promo in a shelf, uh, when you're on promo at the shelf at a store, that's a different thing for when you you know, you send in a merchandising team to apply dollar off coupons, right? It's it's not in the same bucket. Um, you know, making sure that your product is stocked. That's that's a huge, a huge thing. Having out of stocks is um is the largest pain point that we see, right? So one, it's obviously making sure that the product's uh, authorized and on the shelf. When I and when I say authorized and on the shelf, I mean tagged, right? So like there's a tag up. But if the brand, if the unit isn't there to be bought or pulled off from the shelf, there's we call it uh, on shelf availability. Like there's no on shelf availability for the product. So if you know my brother goes and walks into a store, if if it's not there, they can't buy it, and then they're going to end up most likely 
going to another brand or finding something else and they're going to buy that product and you run the risk of them maybe not going back to your product, right? If they like it. So making sure that, you know, your product is fully stocked on the shelf uh, at, at most, if not all times is key as well. Um, taking orders for products, right? A lot of, um, you know, depending on the channel as well too, is is engaging ordering interest. So if you, um, you know, if, if you're in a, an independent location, a lot of those folks have the autonomy to like bring in additional product or, um, you know, or maybe even g give you extra facings on the shelf, um, which is obviously the biggest thing, right? Like when you're in store, you want to have the biggest brand, brand block possible, right? So um, trying to get additional facings or secondary placement, um, you know, uh, all, all that type of stuff as well, too. Stevie, the two things that reminded me of when we were talking about the sales tags. I remember we were selling at Whole Foods and we're supposed to be on promo. I go into one of the store locations and there is no promotion tag on the shelf. And it was like three or four days in from where it was supposed to be. Yeah. And I go to the buyer and they're just like, oh, I just didn't get around to it yet. So I was like, oh, can you do it now? And I think I waited like 45 minutes in the store while they like finished up something before they finally put the tag up. But if I wasn't there to actually go in and talk to them, yeah. I don't know like when that would have happened. Might not have ever happened, right? Like, and and typically, you know, promos aren't usually a long period of time. Like it's a short window for you to, for you to be on that promo. So if you don't have visibility or, or someone fixing it, advocating for you to fix it it's most likely just in the back of you know nobody's going to do it um yeah that's very very common what have you seen in terms of any like examples of maybe at like the founder level building relationships from what you've seen in some early companies like i remember in a different local fees location we got to know the buyer and they gave us a free end cap display and others gave us like a free it's like 20 case display in the hot food bar um, yeah. Or, or snacks. Have you seen any other things that like even just like building relationships at the store level can help get? Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to so Whole Foods actually like just recently flipped over to where they used to be able to do that, where you can have your own field sales team or, or merchant, you know, a founder yourself go in and form a relationship at the store level to then you know, entice them with whether it's promos or whatever the case may be to gain additional placements, right? Um, they just flipped over to what most retailers, how most retailers are set up, that it's a pay to play game, right? Like most, they have a program where you have to pay to get secondary placement. Like if you were to walk into Walmart and say, hey, can I get it? You know, they're going to say, no, it's everything's planogrammed. You know, you need to pay us X, Y, and Z if you want that type of, you know, display up um, and you have to offer them something to do that, right? Like an additional spot or additional uh, space on shelf means more real estate, which means they need to remove another brand that was already there or space from another brand that was already there. Um, so that, and then you need to prove that you're going to sell more than that brand that they're taking away, right? Or whatever the case may be. So when it when it comes to like the large guys, uh, like I use Walmart or Target or, you know, most of those are heavily planogrammed and pay to play. The other, you know, independent, I mentioned independents and mom and pops, those absolutely are all driven by, um, you know, store relationship, personal relationship, right? And it doesn't have to be that you, you know, you know, uh, like the founder doesn't have to go in and know the name of, you know, the guy that the, the guy or gal that's approves that stuff. But as long as you have someone in there on some type of like consistent basis, they're more apt to give you the additional space than someone than another brand who's in their store. And they've never seen anybody from that brand come in there. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And it's very much still like a relationship driven business, anything in the world. Yeah. Like the yeah. time of like technology and everything is done being like Zoom meetings and and right. virtually and, and spreadsheets. You miss that like the people in the stores like doing business with people that they can yeah. get to know or get to meet. And so any regular <laughs> basis are appreciated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so Stevie, there's a lot of stuff that we've talked about and merchandising can get kind of expensive. And so, you know, how much should brands really think about expecting to spend on different merchandising programs, just even to like support all the things that they're doing. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think early on, so I'll give like a general number and this isn't, you know, uh, in stone, but it's usually anywhere between like one to 5%. So I'd say like average at 3% of, of sales. Um, but for, for newer emerging brands, like it could be more, it could be upwards of seven to 10%. Um, if you're just getting started, right. You need to know, like, um, it, it, it depends on like where you're at in the stage of growth with, with the stores and the retailers themselves, but you may have some locations that need a, a lot of extra support in the beginning uh, or throughout, you know, your first year there versus down the line, right? Like ultimately you want to get to a point where, you know, you're not spending a ridiculous amount of money on it, but I think on average, it's, it's probably around 3%. Now I think there's, again, it depends on like what stage you are at and with the retailer, but then also like what stage you are at as a company in itself, right? Like, and what your your growth trajectory is over the next, uh, you know, one to three years. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I think um, that number is, is gets really daunting for brands when they're like, oh, I have to spend 2,000, 3,000, $4,000 a month on supporting a launch. Yeah. And when they're like running the numbers, they're like, wait a second, I don't know if I'll be making any money after like those yeah. fees and distributor chargebacks and all the other things that come through. And so I think, uh, you know, one balance, a lot of emerging brands, I hear them talking about, I was like, how much do I pay for? Like what's actually worthwhile? And yeah. how much, like, how do I think about budgeting? Because like, I know I need it because I can't get to all the stores, but I also you know, right. feel like I won't make money at the beginning. Yeah. No. What? Let me ask you. You were you. You had your own brand. Like what? When you first started, like on average, what were you spending, or not? So, yeah. So we didn't. And that store that I mentioned, where we went to, we were at Mariano stores in the Chicago area that we launched yeah. in, and we had that opportunity. We did not have merchandisers. We were supposed to be at like the checkout in every store, but we weren't because we were at a uh, off reset period. And we went the cheap route and did not have merchandisers. We're not going into all the stores. And ended up um, essentially getting kicked off the store shelf in six months, right? Yeah. And so it would have been more expensive to do all those things at the beginning. And quite frankly, we would have operated at a loss for, at the beginning. But we also lost out on that long-term potential of growing the brand. Yeah. And I think the one thing that I've seen or and heard from other brands and learned is that most times when you're launching into a new retailer no one knows who your brand is um, like yeah. for the smaller brands and yeah. even if they do most of them don't know that you're in that store or where you are yeah. and so it's really a big push to drive just even like awareness that you're even in the store for people to buy and like what your product is yeah. and eventually over time that'll become you'll get more repeat business you'll get more awareness and grow yeah. um one brand that I love is a company, uh, Bomani, who has like a espresso alcohol beverage. And they took a very deliberate approach to like demo heavily, I think like every day in some stores for a limited period of uh, a time because they yeah. thought, I need to convince, you know, I want 100% or 90% of the people who shop at the store to know who we are and that we exist. Then yeah. some buy, some won't, but at least we maximize like the per yeah. store location. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's funny. Um, at, at BevNet, someone, it, it, the, one of the presenters was the CEO of Harmless Harvest, you know, a very large, successful coconut water. And now they do uh, yogurts as well, too. And he, he was talking about like a personal conversation that he was having with, um, I don't know if it was like a friend of his, uh, not a friend of his, like a neighbor or, or something like that. And they asked him, they were like, you know, I wish you carried, they carried your product in, whatever local retailer that was around that person's house she's like and then because she said you know it takes me 40 minutes to get to the nearest whole foods and i just go there basically for this and pick up some other things right and he's like well what re retailer are you talking about and she told him and he's like well we are there he's like but we only have like one skew and one facing you know and it's the skew that she wanted right but like she's norm she's used to seeing like you know, 20 facings in a cooler at Whole Foods of Harmless Harvest, whereas in she goes to like her predominant, her regularly predominant grocery store that she shops in, it's not in the same location. 
it, obviously the set isn't as big, but she, she had no idea she could buy it there. Right. Yeah. So to your point, like, unless you are demoing or sampling, you know, in a new retailer or whatever the case may be, consumers may not know that you're there. Right. They just may not know. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's so important. Yeah. Um, we got another question in from Kelsey about couponing. I think there's multiple parts of that as well. Kelsey, do you want to come up and ask your question? Sure. Hi. Um, Hello. We, I, we have just like kind of launched in Kehi in June um, and we sell Manuka honey, which is like obviously yeah. a high priced item. So we're kind of in that stage of like looking over some of the promos we run and like the MCBs to get in and it's, it's hurting. Um, yeah. so we're definitely looking at, you know, how else can we, effectively give value to the retailers that we're working with and to the customer rather than just feeling like we're getting a bit eaten by the distributors um and so yeah I've been really interested in exploring more about couponing and um yeah some just interested in what are some best practices to activate this yeah, yeah. I um I may not know all the all the details about this one. I apologize, but I think when it comes to couponing, like ultimately, like you're doing it for one of maybe two or three reasons. One, to drive velocity, you know, at the shelf, right? So most times, whether you're you're underperforming or performing low, you're gonna have someone go in or you know whatever the case may be to apply coupons to to drive some turns at the shelf. Um, and, and the other one would be um like sampling, like, like we just said, um, but more, more along the lines of like brand awareness too, right? Like bringing, trying to drive shoppers to the shelf that you're on, um, to let them know that like that, Hey, we're, we're here now, like whether it's new here stickers or new here wobblers on the shelf, like whatever it may be just to bring, you know, consumer awareness. Um, you talk about like the, the, yeah, the, the money that it takes, like it's a, it's a lot of money with giving like a distributor an MCB or, you know, 50 off first or free fill first order, God forbid, you know, something like that. Like it's, um, you need to be able to like, and I'm not on the founder side, but like, you need to be able to like, make sure you do not deplete every penny of your margin either. You know, like that's, that's the most important, like, holy grail, right? Like right out the gate, obviously you're not going to have, you may not have high margins. You need to invest in your business a lot more than you will two, three, five years from now. Um, but, but right away, like you may have to sacrifice some of those margin points to make uh, your customer, your customer, meaning the retailer happy so that they continue to, you know, give you, a bring on additional SKUs or give you additional space or facings and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like a uh, half, half of one, six, a dozen in the other. Um, Jordan, you may know better than me being a manufacturer previously yourself. Yeah, so I just jumped some resources in the chat for some different approaches. So mm -hmm. Mandelik and Rhodes, they're like one of the traditional couponers, right? You think like a paper coupon or barcode that scans and redeem in store. Um, there's usually my recommendation if you want to go that route of being able to put everything together. Um, and then for the digital, sorry, it's my daughter here in background. Um, one that I'm really excited about is digital rebating. So as a company, go the aisle. And what they do is they um, allow you to send or drive customers to store. They purchase your product full price, but then they Venmo you right back. Yeah, their, right. Yeah, they scan the receipt and then they'll Venmo them the the cash. But that way, um, it's a little bit more transparent. The fees are a little um, more inexpensive. Um, but you can use that to drive people to store and not have to deal with like paper coupon redemptions and things like that. And you get the customer's contact information. Um, yeah. Well, that's awesome. I've, I've had a couple of brands that I've seen do that through email to me. Yeah. And I was like, 
are they doing this? <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, yeah. so Go to the Isle is great. And then digital, there's a, a Social Nature is one of the digital sampling companies. And their approach is you are sending free product to, to customers, but you're also, as part of that, they'll like get a code to get a, a free product at the store. They'll go into the store. They'll use that to then drive unit sales. So the store, it brings up as a full purchase of the store. Um, and then you also get surveys from the uh, um, customers and like what they liked about the product, if they purchase again, to so get more customer information for there. So those are just three ways. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Have you tried any of those approaches yet? Or are you just still like in the early stages of trying to figure out like what you want to look at? Yeah, just in the early stages, really. I think I've still really just been focusing on trying to get new stores on board rather than um, trying to do a bit of both building the relationships and stores. It's just it's me. So kind of, I'm not the founder, but kind of like the founder. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. Good luck. And if you have any other questions on those, feel free to shoot us an email and, and follow up. Stevie, what other questions have we not asked yet that you get all the time? Any? Oh, um, I mean, what is merchandising encompass? Uh, how to what is merchandising encompass? How to um ne negotiate off shelf placement? We uh we kind of talked through that. Um, the key times to invest in merchandising, I guess, is one we didn't touch. Um, you know, pe people typically ask that when they're a new brand, like when you know, not so much like when should they activate a third party, but um again it goes down to when you're launching new SKUs in stores um when you're launching in a new retailer um any type of like holiday season that you're you're trying to support whether it's like back to school or you know through the christmas holidays um a lot of times brands come to us when if they're changing packaging or upcs like that's a that's another big one um for you know a lot of emerging brands like they they tend to over time, because of feedback that they get, they tend to either change some type of their packaging size or their, you know, whatever the, whatever it may look like. Um, and, and then it could ultimately like change a UPC as well too. So making sure that you, you support that as well. Um, you know, a lot of times a brand will just assume that, you know, oh, the new, uh, you know, the, we're not using 16 ounce cans anymore. We're using 19.2 ounce cans and they expect that the stores are going to swap all the old product and, and, and tag the new product and all that kind of stuff. And again, it goes back to just not solely relying on the retailer, or the broker, or whatever to do it, but that, that you have your own visibility on it in, in getting it done as well too. Awesome. I love that. One thing I just want to plug as well, um, and thanks so much for saying like, this is great. I didn't even know where to begin. If you are like new merchandiser, you want to find out more information um, together with tracks, we put together an ultimate guide to merchandising on foodbevy.com. So I put the link in the chat, make sure to check that on book market. It goes through everything that we talk through and more so that you can get um, more information um, and a couple of case studies in there as well. Um, Stevie with one thing that I see on uh, LinkedIn, a bunch, especially are brands who, especially in the beverage space, who get these like big displays at checkout where there's like a hundred cases of their healthy soda yeah. or something like that. Um, how do those usually come about? And what impact does that have on like the amount of product a store is ordering and like how fast or slow it takes to sell through those like giant stacks of yeah. products? Again, it goes back to the to the to the channel or the banner itself, right? So, a lot of the stuff is is a pay to play program. So, if if you see large case stacks in Publix or a Target, most of those are are paid for by a brand, um, and not by a brand that just launched there, right? Like they have a they have a proven track record, um, at that at that store. They may obviously have a great relationship with their buyer category manager as well, too. Um, but yeah, I think it just comes down to, um, you know, the, the location itself, right? Like whether it's, whether it's, um, a target or whether it's an independent location where you have, you know, the autonomy to come in to support it. So outside of the, the large, big, big banners, um, you know, if you do see K stacks or large displays, um, in, in more mom and pop independent locations or smaller grocers, um, yeah, like sending in your, sending in a field sales team or merchandising team behind it, making sure that 
um, even before it comes, but even before the promo starts, right. Or whatever you're paying for there, um, making sure that they increase the replenishment orders, you know, or whatever may be in their system. Right. So if they're used to ordering, you know, I don't know, four cases a week, you know, maybe they need to start ordering 10 or 12 so that it doesn't deplete that, that display, uh, over the course of three or four weeks or wh whatever it may be. So making sure that there's enough product there in the back or whatever to continuously stock it so that you don't pay for this big great display sell out and then it's like well you're paying for an empty space for the the next two weeks no that totally makes sense yeah that's interesting it's like most of those are going to be paid opportunities you have to like the store is buying product we also need to make sure that it's kind of there yeah. and sitting yeah, in the weird shelf. dynamic it's a weird <laughs> We have another question in the chat. It's a little bit unrelated to merchandise, but in the last couple of minutes, we can take that on. Um, they're saying, what responsibility the store takes re-damaged goods? They have a chocolate company and they easily break. If they place on the top shelf and it falls, um, then it could be damaged. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or else I can answer? Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about like, okay, so if... Again, what responsibility does the store take? Eh, not, you know, we've kind of talked about this, not, not so much, right? Like it could be anything from like dented cans or a leaky carton or, or you know, uh, a damaged goods. So you would, you would think that if they see it, they pull it off the shelf and pull it in the back, which is great. Um, nine times out of 10, they, they most, most times don't do it. Um, so again, you need to have someone that goes in and make sure that, you know, the, the integrity, you just, product integrity is, is intact. So if you have a product, um, like for example, I have a client that is, a um, uh, like a, a soap, a soap brand, right. And they use cartons, not plastic. Well, it, they know that there's going to be some type of issues in store, whether it's leaking a little bit or damaged, just by shipping the project naturally, right? Um, not a ton. Obviously, their Q and A de department on the back end is trying to fix as much as possible, but they'll they send us into stores to do regular merchandising visits, and then they instruct us. They'll say, "Hey, can you purchase, you know, whatever damage you product you find, whether it's two units in a store or three units or whatever the case may be," um, and then either you could either do one of two things. You could either purchase it and then obviously take it out of the store itself. Or if you don't have the, the budget to purchase the, the bad product, um, then you would just instruct your field sales team or merchandising team to pull it from the shelf, bring it over to store personnel, have them zero it out in the scanner, pull new product from the back and, you know, and, and set it correctly. Um, and Jordan, you could kind of correct me if I'm wrong on this, but when they do end up giving it to the back, right? Like what happens then? There's a couple different things I think that you'd be able to know in your previous life. Yeah. And it depends on how your product is distributed to the store. Right. And so if you are selling directly to the store, depending on the price of the product and the type of store, the store just might write that off as shrink and spoilage right. on the end. If they're pulling through a KEHI or UNFI, they actually have agreements where if the product is damaged or, um, or expired, frankly, like it just doesn't sell and it reaches the expiration date, they can return it to the distributor and then they'll charge that back to the brand. So you'll have to pay for it. That happened with T-Squares, quite frankly, when we were selling Julasco, we had a bunch of product that reached its um, end of life without selling and started getting these chargebacks from the, the retailer. Through yeah, the ex expiration is the is same. It's like the same thing, right? Damage yeah. product expiration. It's a similar uh, process, kind of how to fix it. Exactly. Or, or mitigate it because you can never really totally fix it, right? Yep. And they'll actually charge you more than the product was worth to to get that out. So it's a, it's a whole thing. Um, so yeah, it depends on who you're, how you're getting it to the store and who you're selling it to. Um, you know, Stevie, it's interesting. One thing you just mentioned is like my, uh, at Target, we shop there and buy these snacks for my daughters. And there's a case of like individually packed snacks and the case is open. And there's like the tape got cut and it's been in there for like a month at least or two months. And every time we're looking for it, there's like one good product. And then that open case, no it's one buys there. it, but it's sitting on the shelf. Right. And it's never going to sell because who wants yeah. to buy an open case of product for kids? Right. Um, and so it's just the example of like, you know, they probably have no idea that row case is sitting there and how many of those are across, you know, the hundreds of target stores. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's it's wild. Again, I came from a finance. I came from a finance background. And when I first realized like how retail works, I was like, this is the general public has no idea how, how stuff gets on shelf, stays on shelf, all that kind of stuff. Like they just think that, again, the person that's at ShopRite does it all. It's like, no, that's not even close. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Stevie, for joining us today. I think uh, this is definitely hugely beneficial in terms of just setting the context of like what merchandising is and the ways that brands should really get involved. I think one thing as a takeaway is for founders, like do as much as you can yourself early yeah. on to learn what works, what doesn't. And also just know that getting into retail is an investment and know that it can take sometimes a year for large retailers before you see that investment pay off, but you have to build that foundation of customer awareness and trial before you'll start seeing the repeat business. Um, they'll actually be Absolutely. profitable later on. Yeah. Fu fully concentrate on hitting singles and doubles first before swinging for home runs. A absolutely right. Awesome. Well, the recording of this, as I mentioned, will go out probably on Monday. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks so much for everyone for joining us. Stevie, if people have questions uh, as yeah. follow up, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, you could either email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Stevie Allegretto. So it's stevie.allegretto at Tracks Retail or LinkedIn is Stevie Allegretto. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us and have a great end of the week. Thanks, y'all.